Thank you for tuning in to our podcast, The Top Three, which is brought to you by the History Department of the U.S. Naval Academy, located in Annapolis, Maryland. In this show, we'll discuss and debate some of the key turning points, trends, and major figures of world history. We'll do so with the understanding that history is often a matter of controversy. Our goal is to explore the varied landscapes and seascapes of the past, in the hope of shedding some light on how the present world came to be. In the studio today are our three co-hosts, Lieutenant Mac Anderson, Associate Professor Thomas Burgess, and Lieutenant Commander Andy Cox. All of us are instructors and lifelong students of history. This is our second part of a two-parter on the worst betrayals in modern world history. In the previous episode, we discussed the betrayals of Talleyrand, Mir Jafar, and Benedict Arnold. Today, we'll continue to delve into backstabbing history, starting with Tom's second entry of a very recent example our listeners may not have heard of. So proxy wars have been quite common in Africa's post-colonial history, and perhaps never more tragically so than in Southern Africa, as I will try to explain in this rather complicated story. In 1975, Portugal finally withdrew from their colony of Mozambique, handing power over to a Marxist guerrilla organization known as Frilimo. The transition instantly upset the balance of power in the region. Now the white minority regimes of Rhodesia and South Africa would have to contend with a hostile state on their borders. Frilimo allowed two African liberation movements to launch attacks on Rhodesia from its soil. In retaliation, the Rhodesians sponsored and equipped their own black Mozambican rebel group known as Renamo to launch attacks on Frilimo. Eventually, Rhodesian whites could see the writing on the wall and agreed to end the war and allow the African majority of their country the right to vote. When Rhodesia became Zimbabwe in 1980, the apartheid regime of South Africa lost a crucial ally and had to decide its policy towards Mozambique. The two nations had extensive economic ties, yet Frelimo supported the ANC, which for decades had been struggling against apartheid, and whose leader, Nelson Mandela, was still in prison. That said, Frelimo did not want war with South Africa, knowing it would destroy the economy. Yet the South Africans decided to dust off Renamo and use it against Mozambique. With South African supplied weapons, radios, and intelligence, Renamo went on a rampage, burning, killing, and destroying infrastructure across central Mozambique. One goal was to destabilize the country and force Frelimo to end its support for the ANC. Another was to show that Frelimo had no way of governing, much less developing the vast territory it inherited from the Portuguese. Finally, in 1984, we have what is known as the Incomati Accord, by which Frelimo agreed to end its support of the ANC in exchange for South Africa abandoning Renamo. In other words, the proxy war would come to an end. Here is the betrayal in this story. South Africa continued to train and aid Renamo, which proceeded to turn Mozambique into one of the poorest and most dangerous countries in the world. Aside from destroying homes, schools, bridges, and clinics, Renamo was also guilty of numerous violent atrocities against the civilian population. By the end of the 1980s, Mozambique was an international basket case, with most of its economy in ruins and pushed back at least a a generation in terms of its development. You know, Thomas, this is just a sad story. We can see uh, the the power and the political struggles coming into uh, conflict with race struggles, with with class struggles. You know, and correct me if I'm wrong, but Renamo, they were actually... Mozambican, correct? Yes, black Mozambicans. And so you have Rhodesia and later South Africa funding black Mozambicans to fight against other poor black Mozambicans. To me, it's just mind-blowing that uh, the geopolitics led to these kinds of struggles. Yeah, it is mind-boggling and depressing when you get into it, just how this country is devastated by larger geopolitical considerations outside of any one person's control. I'm really glad you included this story, Tom, because I had never heard of it. I'd like to know what happened afterwards. What happened to the members and leaders of Frelimo and Renamo when this was all done? 
Well, several things happened. First of all, the U.S. eventually decided to not treat Frelimo like a Marxist enemy in the Cold War. Instead of put pressure on South Africa to end their support for Renamo, which they did. Yet Renamo refused to stand down and end the war until Frelimo agreed to elections and a new constitution. So Frelimo accepted these demands, also in part due to Western pressure. So in the early 1990s, Renamo disarmed and demobilized and made the transition from fighting in the bush to contesting elections, which it then lost to Frelimo. So with the war's end in the 1990s, Mozambique became a client state of the IMF receiving billions of dollars in Western aid to help rebuild its shattered society. So this is the kind of economic aid that the Soviet Union, that had formerly been supporting Frelimo as a Marxist state, could never possibly offer. So in some ways, as I tell my students, it was the IMF that won the Cold War in Southern Africa. That's really interesting. And it happened right at the, the birth of modern Mozambique. Right. This this instability comes right at the uh, as decolonization is also happening. Yeah. I mean, the Portuguese basically in 75 threw in the towel, decided we're done. Uh, and in fact, it was the Portuguese military that threw in the towel. They launched a coup against their own government in Lisbon, a civilian government to end the war. And they just handed power over to an unelected Marxist organization called Frelimo, which now is actually an elected government and no longer Marxist and pro-West and all that. Okay, so let's turn now to Andy Cox, who's going to give us uh, something from another part of Asia. That's right. You know, some betrayals are born out of rivalries. When emotions and personal history push an individual so far into antagonism that they can really lose the forest for the trees. Wang Jingwei, a Chinese nationalist in the 20th century, could be considered one of these. His story involves the great dream of a unified, independent China, but his rivalry with other nationalists led him to take actions that many of his countrymen found unforgivable. Wang Jingwei was a Chinese revolutionary and one of the most important political leaders of the Guomintang, KMT, the Chinese National Party. After the KMT's legendary founder Sun Yat-sen died in 1925, Wang clashed with the KMT's military leader, Chiang Kai-shek, for control of the party, but he lost. The two men agreed on the goal of uniting China, but were bitterly opposed on whether to accommodate communists and judging foreign friends and threats. Wang was willing to work with communists for unification, opposed making any foreign alliances with quote-unquote white powers like the USA or the Russians, and believed that they should avoid fighting Japan's modern military at all if Chinese independence could be otherwise preserved. Chiang Kai-shek expelled all the communists from the KMT and believed Japan was their biggest foreign threat, and he had no problems allying with the US to help fight Japan. And Zhang was in charge, much to Wang's fury. When war with Japan started in 1937, Wang grew more pessimistic about China's chances, and he announced he would support a negotiated settlement with Japan. Picking up on this, the Japanese invited him to lead a collaborationist government in their conquered Chinese territory. Here was his chance to finally establish a new nationalist-led Chinese government out from under Chiang Kai-shek. Wang agreed, attended secret meetings in Japan, And in March of 1940, he became the head of the Reorganized National Government of the Republic of China, or the Wang Jingwei regime. He governed Japanese-occupied areas of China around the capital city of Nanjing, and he hoped for Chinese autonomy with his new friends. But the regime was a Japanese puppet, and the association did him and his people no favors. In November of 1940, he signed a treaty giving the Japanese decisive control of politics, finance, policing, and economic sectors. Daily life for his citizens went from difficult to awful as World War II turned badly against Japan. The Japanese kept occupied areas under strict military and economic control and attempted to introduce their own culture and dress upon the Chinese. The army established concentration camps while the Kempeitai, the Japanese secret police, and Chinese collaborators censored everything, monitored opposition, and tortured dissenters. The Wang Jingwei regime had limited means to ease Chinese suffering, and his cooperation with Japan incurred their wrath. 
Wang himself became a focal point of resistance movements against Japanese occupation. The KMT and the communists both labeled him a traitor to China, and the populace at large branded him a traitor to his Han Chinese identity. Wang died in March of 1944 while in Japan for medical treatment, but many of his followers were executed after World War II ended. He was buried in Nanjing, near the Sun Yat-sen Memorial, but the KMT later destroyed his tomb. Today, many Chinese regard him as a traitor in the war of resistance to Japanese rule, although some academics debate if his collaboration outweighs his contributions to the Xinhai Revolution that overthrew the Qing Dynasty. Still, his name has become a byword for traitor, much like Quisling, Arnold, or Mir Jafar. Uh, that's great, Andy. Yeah, I, I think this is an amazing story. It really illustrates just how chaotic and uh, sort of a Game of Thrones-like situation that China was in for the first half of the 20th century. You have the, the last remnants of the Manchu dynasty still trying to grasp onto power. You have rival nationalist factions. You have the communists. Um, you have the Japanese, the Western powers. And that's not even to mention the Chinese warlords who carved up China amongst themselves in the 1920s. So, you know, this is a chaotic situation. So we have this person trying to navigate these these uh, troubled waters. And in Wang's case, he seemed to have led a personal dispute with Chiang Kai-shek. And his extreme distrust of Westerners led him to this fateful decision of collaborating with the Japanese. This is even after they committed the rape of Nanjing and other horrific atrocities against his own people. So it's no surprise that he's remembered as a traitor among among his own people. Yeah, I think the timing of that atrocity and then the collaborationist government is one of the more unforgivable aspects, at least from the from the Chinese perspective to this, which is what makes this such a betrayal story. Yeah. And it's also what I like about this narrative is, is it adds nuance. We often think in this interwar period, it was the KMT versus the Chinese Communist Party, period. There was no other, no other nuance. What this shows though is that even within the KMT itself, there were different, uh, visions, right? Of how China should be run, of who China should uh, ally itself with. And ultimately, to me, it seems like, uh, for Wang, uh, he went with this philosophy of it's better to to get in bed with the devil you know than the one you don't, right? Of, of allying himself with the Japanese who had already committed atrocities, vice making potential alliances with with the whites, essentially Russia or Soviet Union and the United States. Um, clearly, he was very wary of that. So uh, definitely a nuanced tale of China in the interwar period. All right. Well, back to you, Mac, for your second one. Let's wrap this up. What do you have? Well, we often think of betrayals as something deeply personal between a handful of individuals, the actions of Britain and France in the face of the German invasion of Poland absolutely qualify as one of the worst betrayals in modern history. Britain and France turned a blind eye as their Polish allies were overrun by both Germany and the Soviet Union in 1939. Some may say that Hitler's betrayal of Stalin via Operation Barbarossa takes the cake as one of the worst betrayals in World War II. But when you make a deal with the devil, or when you make a deal with Hitler, you should expect to be betrayed. On the other hand, the Poles were surprised. They were disappointed at the lack of the Allied commitment to their cause, despite all the high-handed rhetoric about freedom that had been espoused by British and French diplomats prior to the invasion. The sense of being left high and dry in the face of the Nazi invasion ran so deep that historian Max Hastings titled the first chapter of his wonderful book Inferno as, quote, Poland Betrayed. After the invasion of Czechoslovakia by Nazi forces, the Polish government started to see the writing on the wall and sought mutual defense treaties with both France and Britain. Upon meeting with French leaders, the Polish Minister of War Affairs was guaranteed that France would strike swiftly against Germany within three weeks if Germany dared attack Poland. Similarly, the agreement of mutual assistance between Poland and Great Britain promised military action in defense of Poland in the event of a German invasion. Hitler launched his invasion on the evening of 31 August with a staged attack against a German radio station conducted by German convicts dressed in Polish uniforms. Decrying this surprise attack, 
Hitler ordered the three million men he had conveniently mobilized to the Polish border to start the invasion in the early morning of 1 September. Two days later, France and Britain declared war on Germany, upholding their treaty obligations, albeit in name only. While this was somewhat of a shock to Hitler, who expected France and Britain would simply step aside just as they had done with the annexation of Czechoslovakia, in essence, the initial involvement of France and Britain had absolutely no effect on Hitler's plans for Poland. While Polish cavalrymen boldly charged German mechanized units at Krojanty and Kalusim, the French marched five miles into the German Saarland and promptly halted their advance, believing that Poland could hold off Germany long enough for the French rearmament program to finish. Meanwhile, as Max Hastings notes, the Polish ambassador to Great Britain was arrogantly told, quote, how lucky you are. Who would have thought six months ago that you would have Britain on your side as an ally, end quote. Yet this alliance meant absolutely nothing to the tens of thousands of Poles being slaughtered by the far more advanced German military machine and the hundreds of thousands then being captured by both the Nazis and the Soviets. Hastings additionally writes about a powerful moment where the Polish ambassador to France captured the essence of Polish frustration with their allies. The Polish ambassador stated to the French foreign minister, It isn't right. You know it isn't right. A treaty is a treaty and must be respected. Do you realize that every hour you delay the attack on Germany means death to thousands of Polish men, women, and children? The French foreign minister simply shrugged and replied back, Do you then want the women and children of Paris to be massacred? Within three weeks, the Polish resistance was all but broken. Although Poland began 1939 with the fourth largest standing army in Europe, its equipment was woefully outdated and was no match for the modernized German military. When the Soviets invaded Poland on 17 September, all hope of resistance failed. France and Britain knew that they would not be able to immediately come to the aid of Poland, yet each made assurances in 1939 that they would. The gamble of trying to scare off a German invasion of Poland had failed. Poland was left alone to face the onslaught of German and Soviet soldiers. Poland had been betrayed. You know, this betrayal strikes me as different in character than some of the others we've talked about. Instead of on the personal level of person to person or person to government, this is a national betrayal. And it hits especially hard because the scale seems bigger. It implicates a whole lot more people in its effects. Uh, and it has, I think, implications for the national character we're talking about many ambassadors and government officials of France and Britain and Poland involved here. Do you think the UK and the French just didn't realize the state of Polish military readiness in their calculations of like how seriously they thought they were going to have to back up their word? A Andy, that's a great point. And it brings up this idea of, of what military strategy and planning looked like prior to World War II. And that was, in essence, that bigger is better. Uh, and that's what they were looking at. It was purely quantitatively based. So Poland had, uh, just prior to the invasion, Poland had 30 active infantry divisions, 30 reserve infantry divisions, and 12 cavalry brigade, brigades. We can compare that to Germany that had 100 infantry divisions and six armored divisions. So it was well understood, even just by playing the numbers game, that Poland could not hold off Germany forever. But... France and Britain looked and said, well, 60 infantry divisions, 12 cavalry brigades, the Poles are known for riding horses into battle. Yeah, they'll be able to wait long enough, uh, or they'll be able to hold Germany off long enough until we're actually ready. The problem was, that's not what they told Poland. They said, France at least said, three weeks, we will be marching towards Berlin. We will come to your aid. And what did they do? five miles off the French border, and they came to a stop. Yeah, to be somewhat cynical about this, one has to wonder if the British and French merely were bluffing that they were signing a treaty with the Polish to try and deter Hitler from moving against them, that this would be the line in the sand uh, across which Hitler would not, you know, violate. This would be the line in the sand that would prevent war and prevent Hitler's further territorial ambitions in Europe. Um, is that so? Is that a reasonable analysis? I mean, was this merely a failed bluff? Did they have any intention of following through? 
No, they they couldn't have. Um, it was absolutely an attempt to make that neck that transition from appeasement to kind of empty threats, right? Where instead of uh, appeasing Germany, now we're going to try to say, well, we we've got solid alliances. We will come to Poland's aid. So you better not invade Germany, or else you'll have all ninety French divisions come into Berlin, right? But no, they simply weren't ready. They could not have credibly followed through with their promises to Poland, albeit Poland expected them to. It just seems also that this is perhaps one of the greatest squandered strategic opportunities for the Allies during the entire war, because with what roughly three quarters of the German Wehrmacht committed to the east, they were exposed and weak in the west. Something could have happened, who knows what, but certainly the French could have gone much further than six miles into the Saarland. They could have pushed on to Stuttgart or some other place and and really complicated things for Hitler from from the get-go, but they had no intention of doing so. Yeah, exactly. There, there was no momentum gained as a result of British or French actions, which kept the ball firmly in Germany's court in terms of momentum, in terms of that blitzkrieg strategy. Uh, I would agree. It was a huge lost opportunity. Hindsight is 1945. We're going to take a break, and when we come back, it's time to narrow it down from six to three. Welcome back. And now we enter the next phase where we throw all of our entries into the octagon to square off for who is the most deserving of the title of greatest betrayal. We have six. We need three. And you're welcome to critique each other's choices or explanations of the events. I'm sure we've got differing opinions, but we should be able to come up at a consensus without the knives coming out. Should. I want to start by lining up some criteria here. What do you guys consider a true betrayal? And what makes one traitor worse than another? Yeah, for me, it's all about real harm, right? It can't just be symbolic. It has to have actually resulted in real harm being done to somebody or lots of people. There need to be historical consequences and principles also betrayed. Yeah, I can see that. I also think... In a, in a sense, not just of real harm, but also scope and scale here. It's not that he who harms the most people is necessarily the worst, but it kind of, like that definitely puts a thumb on the scale for me. So I'm I'm going to lean more towards betrayals that had worse consequences for more groups of people are usually worse than just you know the everyday sort of person to person knife in the back. And, I mean, we we can also look at motivations, right? Is a betrayal over money? Uh, on the same level as somebody who uh, betrays a lover or betrays uh, a, a country based on values, right? Is the motivation behind the betrayals also something that could be considered? Yeah, and I think you raised a good point earlier, Mac, about how Hitler's betrayal of Stalin didn't make our list because these were both ruthless dictators who were utterly untrustworthy. They should have suspected each other from the get-go Stalin should not have been surprised by what happened in 1941, but Poland was surprised by both the French and the British. So that also should be entered into the mix, just that some people should not be trusted from the very beginning, such as Hitler and Stalin. I agree. Uh, and, and sort of turning that the other way, I think we should consider not just the motivations of the betrayal, but also the motive, the, the character of the trust that is betrayed, where you know, is this an oath to an institution or another individual? Is this an expectation of a treaty? Is it, what is it that is being broken? Yeah, yeah. Uh, that idea of, of trust is, is huge, right? You know, so with us in the studio today, we've got uh, two new producers or two producers, uh, Jeff Hobbs and Terrence Viernes. And, you know, I've been working with Jeff for a while, right? We've been doing this for a few months. Um, if he stabbed me in the back, or kicked me off the podcast, I'd, I'd feel pretty betrayed, right? Uh, that's a, uh, I've been working with him. I have trust. Terrence, he's a new guy. He's been here for a couple of weeks. If he tried to betray me, I'd say, I ah, don't have that much trust. It's, that's clearly just who Terrence is. So trust. I love it. I think that's big. We don't want to raise the curtain too much on the inner workings of the Naval Academy History Department here. So why don't we get to talking about who's our favorites and who's our least favorite? Well, Terrence could be Stalin for all we know. So we have to... Uh... <laughs> Keep I've never seen them in the same room at the same time. It's true. 
All right. Uh, so kicking things off, let's look at um, – Thomas, let's look at your two, right? So we've got Renamo uh, fighting against Mozambique. We've got Talleyrand betraying everybody who he's ever come in contact with. I think based on some of these criteria that we've come up with, you know, in terms of real harm, in terms of trust, I'm really leaning towards Renamo. I think this idea of poor – Africans betraying each other as part of a colonial post-colonial power struggle it is really that hits at the heart I think uh whereas Talleyrand a one man a political elite just trying to make money and have fun with a bunch of women I just don't think that touches on this idea of a deep betrayal as much as uh the funding south africa's continued funding of renamo basically forcing similar peoples to fight against each other with the sole purpose of keeping a country impoverished it's it's wild to me yeah south africa's betrayal of mozambique here is uh utterly inexcusable and what they did to mozambique is goes down as you know a war atrocity you know writ large absolutely um, their idea of a good defense was a, you know, a good offense, basically. So I should point out, however, that re- there were, the people who fought for Renamo were sometimes coerced young men. They had no choice in the matter, or they were deeply disaffected from the fr- Frelimo regime. The Frelimo regime did a few things to, to really piss people off. They put people in re- re-education camps. They, they took people's lands. They disempowered chiefs and local healers. They were, it was a Marxist regime that made some terrible mistakes from the very beginning. That said, you know, um, most people who fought against Frelimo did, did so because they were coerced or were merely opportunists. Um, so, but I, I would agree with you that, you know, in terms of historical consequences, the Mozambique, uh, one probably has, uh, more consequences than Talleyrand's various betrayals. Not to disagree with anything you just said about the severity of the betrayal of, you know, of Renamo, but just to just to put the out the other side out there, you think that's worse than Talleyrand, whose superpower was betrayal? And if you co- if you consider each subsequent betrayal to be a different government, he's racked up national betrayals. Like I think we have to count on both hands by the time his career is done. Um, no, no back and forth on that one. I mean, I think if you look at Talleyrand, if you look at France and the age of Napoleon, uh, for the most part, Napoleon was able to su- to succeed despite some of Talleyrand's uh, betrayals, as we can call them. Uh, he still went on to build a massive empire. Uh, Talleyrand never, uh, as far as I know, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, Tom, ta- Talleyrand did not result in the downfall of Napoleon. He just had multiple uh, interactions where we could say they were betrayals of what France or Napoleon stood for. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think that uh, had Talleyrand not been on the scene, other people would have likewise betrayed Napoleon, especially in 1814 when he refused to surrender or to give up his throne or to believe that Paris was lost, the war was lost. Uh, Talleyrand was only one of many people who were turning against Napoleon at that time. Okay, so let's move on now to Andy's entries. And I just think that there's sort of a clear difference between the story of Mir Jafar and Wang Xingwei. There's little in defense of Wang's betrayal of the Chinese people. Yet one must assume that if he had not agreed to collaborate in the way that he did, the Japanese would have probably found someone else to fill his shoes. Wang was somewhat replaceable in that sense. That's how I feel about it. That is... But Mir Jafar was not replaceable. What he did at the Battle of Plassey was it changed history. It was his personal decision to turn against his sovereign, to side with the British. Had things been different, then the British would have lost the battle and perhaps been jeopardized in their whole position in Bengal. They might have been thrown into the sea, for all we know. This is one of those what-if questions. So certainly... Mir Jafar in 1757 played a decisive personal role in in the trends of history in the way that Wang Xingwei did not. I just think that he would be replaceable by one person or another. The Japanese would have found other collaborators to fill his shoes. I can generally agree with that. Yeah, I should note Mir Jafar was one of several conspirators that the British approached and and turned against the Mughals. Um, but he was the most important, he was the most personally driven, and he was promised the throne. 
Um, I think in that sense, perhaps the British could have found another, but they definitely found their guy in Mir Jafar. Whereas with Wang Jingwei, the Japanese found a pretty high-placed and important KMT official who they needed as a patsy for the puppet state. Um, there's probably some parallels we could draw between the two, but the effects of Wang Jingwei's regime are not nearly as bad as, say, what happens after Mir Jafar and the rest of the subjugation of India. I, in, in, I, I agree with you generally, especially in terms of outcomes. Not to put anything uh, against the, the suffering of the Chinese people under that collaborationist regime at all. Um, but what happens after Mir Jafar is the just all-encompassing pattern of divide, conquer, and subjugate under the East India Company over the next century and a half. And I think in Wong's case, at, at least he was consistent. You know, we often say that as a joke. You're bad at this, but at least you're consistent. You know, he his whole mantra was no Western powers. Uh, let's not fight Japan because we'll lose. And it's not all that bad if we incorporate the communists into our ruling system. So while he inevitably chose the wrong side of history, he was consistent in doing so. Um, whereas Mir Jafar... He just wanted the throne for himself, at least it seems to me. So I think that's a bit more egregious. Simple man, simple goals. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well then I'd like to turn to yours then, Mac. Uh, because for me, uh, as, as tempting as it might be to keep the crown of traitor supreme on Benedict Arnold's head, when compared to the UK and French betrayal of Poland. I think that really takes the cake. Oh, come on. You're, you're talking about a 38-year-old man who starts betraying his country to sleep with some pretty 19-year-old. I think that's a pretty compelling betrayal here. The story is made for television. Absolutely. But Benedict Arnold's betrayal is more about his character and the shock to the Americans, I feel, especially in retrospect, than anything else. You know, him changing sides, it could have been disastrous, but they found out about it and he had to run and it really didn't change that much about the war. Whereas the betrayal of the Poles is really kind of what kicks off World War II and the country is torn apart and subjugated between two different totalitarian regimes. I don't see Benedict Arnold holding a candle to that. <laughs> no, no. You know, and when I think back to one of the criteria we just talked about earlier, and that is real harm. Right. And the scale of that real harm. Certainly a piece of the harm was the, the raiding that Arnold conducted in Virginia, uh, in Connecticut. But that is, like you said, it doesn't hold a candle to the devastation wrought on Polish civilians by both Germany and the Soviet Union uh, when Britain and France decided to stay on, on the sidelines. So I think when we when we look back to some of the criteria we've discussed, I would ultimately agree that even though Arnold, it's a, it's a tale as old as time, betray, betray values for a woman, even though that's a tale as old as time, I, I do agree that uh, Britain and France, that betrayal fits better on this, on this top list. It should be mentioned that the Poles lost a larger part of their population than any other European country. It wasn't just because of the Jewish Holocaust, but the Polish middle class, the intelligentsia were wiped out by the Germans trying to uh, completely dismember Polish society and, you know, uh, assimilate the remnants into German society, perhaps. And in general, there was a, a notable lack of collaboration between the Poles and Germany or the Soviet Union. You would think it'd be pretty easy, right, to say, oh, France and Britain abandoned you. Come join our side. For the most part, the Poles resisted. They continued to resist. And that, I think, makes it even more uh, pressing, uh, depressing, the fact that France and Britain hadn't come to save them. And yet, the Poles did not immediately go to their conquerors and say, okay, we'll help you now, because they betrayed us. They had, they stood by their values. Meanwhile, back in the U.S., I don't think anyone's kicking Benedict Arnold off of his traitor throne. Yeah, absolutely. If, if you ask uh, some of the folks walking around the Naval Academy today, which I might do after this podcast, you'll, you'll definitely get Benedict Arnold. But uh, in the end, gents, it, it looks like we've settled on our top three betrayals. We've got the UK and France abandoning Poland during the German invasion in World War II. You've got Mir Jafar refusing to act at the Battle of Plassey. And, of course, the continued support given by South Africa to Renamo to fight against Mozambique. 
While there is, as always, plenty more to debate about this topic, we'll save that for a round of beer between friends. We hope we've inspired you to discuss some of these topics and these historical events yourself, and we'd love to hear your thoughts on today's discussion. From all of us here at the Naval Academy, thanks for tuning in to the top three.